Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scary Stories We Tell. I am still your host, Chris Stashu, and I'm joined by a couple people who you have heard here before. Uh, one of them is one of the hosts of Surreal Tube, Dustin. Hello. And uh, this is an episode of a thing I've been wanting to do for a very long time, and there will be a couple things that I need to address before we get to what we're talking about. But we are also joined by good friend of the show. You've heard him here before. He is now a podcast host in his own right, though to be fair, he technically was on Rankin and Bass to begin with. But this is the first time he's going out into his own, on his own, into the wilds of podcasting. The host of Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, Richard Haddam. Hey, man, how are you? Also the, the writer of the Mothman Prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> That's purely secondary. <laughs> right. That's not why you're here. nothing to do with tonight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell, so, Richard, this is the first time we talked about it on the show before we get into Mothman. Tell the audience a little bit about your show, your, your soon your soon-to-come-out mm. show. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, it's called Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. It's um, sort of a personal memoir slash paranormal podcast. Uh, the premise is every episode, I take a book off my shelf, one of my many, many classic paranormal books, the nonfiction ones. I'm not talking about Stephen King. I'm talking about Colin Wilson, Whitley Strieber, you know, John Keel, John Keel. Yeah. R- real life people uh, writing about purportedly real life events. And I talk about the book. I'll sort of do a deep dive into the book or deep ish, depending on the week. And then, um, and then definitely segue into what was happening in my life when I read the book, what, what the book brings up, uh, you know, what it, what it refers. There's there's always a personal story in there too. So it's sometimes it's way more personal story. Sometimes it's just the book and my opinions and thoughts about the book. Uh, usually it's somewhere in between. So, um, but it's really fun. It's all, it's very autobiographical. It's all personal memoir and personal opinion and personal remembrances. Uh, I think it's fun and funny and sad. And uh, I've enjoyed writing it more than I've enjoyed writing anything for <laughs> decades. So I'm having a good time and I've never done anything like it. So this is totally new. So check it out. Richard Adams, Paranormal Bookshelf on your favorite podcast platform that's not why you're here richard that's not why i'm here and that's not why dustin's here uh the three of us are here to do um and this will come as a surprise to the audience because i have not talked about it yet but i will take this as the opportunity to do so uh this will be uh the penultimate episode of scary stories we tell for the foreseeable future uh unfortunately Due to just rearrangements in life and time and scheduling and all the other things that come into and go out of making a creative endeavor, uh, it's not that I don't like this one anymore, and it's not like I don't want to keep doing it, but there are other things that are taking my time away from this, and it is taking the time away in a way that what I would be providing to the audience would not be something uh, of the level and quality that I am okay putting out. And so I am making the decision, uh, along with Dustin and Emma and Jess, to take a step back from the show for the foreseeable future. That doesn't mean it won't come back in some form in the future. There will still be episodes and things that still need to get run that were side projects that we were working on while doing the show. But I just wanted to let you, the audience, know kind of what's going on here with the show, why there's been a gap in everything going on, and all the other unfortunate things that come with reassessing and readdressing time and how one uses time for creative uh, and personal endeavors, but in this respect, creative. Um, So yeah, I just wanted to make you, the audience, aware because I don't want you to feel like, oh, and then one day the show just stopped posting and nobody understood why. I respect you as an audience member way too much as someone who listens to this show to just disappear off the face of the earth. So yeah, so this is the uh, possible, uh, more than likely the penultimate episode of the show. We'll do one more episode just to kind of bring everything to a close, as it were. But I mentioned all of this because this is something that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Richard, you and I have talked about Under Siege 2 a lot (laughs) <laughs> yeah. uh, two times, at least, I think, in recorded form, once on On Seagull and once on the Culture Cast. But we have yet to talk about the Mothman, like at all. Like it, we've mentioned it when we talk, but I've never just asked you, not even, uh, not, not that's going to be this, like going to be a grill fest 2024, but there will be questions oh. that I've been, <laughs> right. There will be questions that I think Dustin and I will have for you. But at the same time, I do want to talk broadly about kind of the Mothman. And, you know, the the Mothman himself, less specifically the the movie's version of the Mothman, 
I think is a, is a good way of putting it. But uh, when Dustin and I were talking about kind of where the show was going to go, he was like, what was one of the, th- what is one of the things you always wanted to do on the show? And it was talk to you about this movie, because as much as I like Under Siege 2, uh, if you go and listen to the episodes that we've done about it, you, the listener, will know that Under Siege 2 ain't exactly Richard's project all the way through. Now, this, on the other hand, this is... This is right, Richard. Like this is your this is your thing still. Like to this, yeah, day. I would say, yeah, it's you know, I mean, definitely. You you have to understand when when you talk about a writer's work being represented in a future film. Sometimes, okay. So you had a question. Oh, oh, okay. So I I, I remember it, and I'll I'll begin. Yeah, just go for it. Go for it. Yeah. In terms of answering, well, you had asked before. You know, how does the movie represent my work? I think it does in a big way. Um, More so than Under Siege 2 does, right? I mean, I know we've talked about that before. And like, you always say the thing of like, there's only one line that I wrote left in the movie. And like, I never know if you're being hyperbolic. Like, because like, it's it's like me saying I didn't do anything last year. And it's like, I mean, I did plenty of shit. But like, I, you know what I mean? Like, are you being hyperbolic when you've said that in the past? Or is that actually the case? Like, I don't know, Richard, because I'm as much part of the industry as I am. Like, I'm not. You're right. I mean, I, I, and it's weird. I mean, it's, it's hard to understand. Even, even I have trouble understanding sometimes. There's, there's so many answers. Look, answer number one is when your name is on something and someone comes up to you and says, Hey, I saw your movie. I really liked it. You say, thank you. Even if you didn't write a word of it. Okay. Now, right. That having been said, that's just, that's just the way you behave in Hollywood. That's, you know, the correct way to behave. Common courtesy but, that you're giving to someone who doesn't more than likely understand the industry, even right. less so than I do or Dustin does. Yeah. Well, that, that, you know, there's a story about Jerry Lewis. Um, I think it's about Jerry Lewis. It should be about Jerry Lewis, where someone came up to him and complimented one of his films. And he's like, what are you talking about? That piece of crap? He's like, I hated that movie. You should have seen it. We, we wanted it to be this and it turned out to be that. You know, my God, that's a piece of crap. Go see the other nutty professor or whatever. Right. And the person walks away and I forget who the person was standing next to him. It wasn't Dean Martin, but they're like, what the hell are you doing? That person liked a movie of yours. They don't need to know your story and your disappointments. You say thank you and let them have a good interaction with you. What do you think you're, you're correcting them? You've talked them out of liking your movie. Good work. Right. And now the next time they talk to anybody else, they're going to say, you know, I used to like this thing, but then I met my hero. I mean, hero is what people always say, but like, but then I met the person I was like, ah, shit. Well, you become afraid to say anything nice to anyone now. Now you meet someone else and you want to say, I want to say I like that movie, but maybe they don't. So I better just not say anything. Okay. I don't know why I'm saying all this. I'm thrilled with Under Siege 2. I'm even more thrilled with Mothman. The situation with Under Siege 2 is that Matt Matt and I wrote a movie that if they had made the script that we had written, it would be a a, a beautiful, wonderful, perfectly crafted uh, adventure film. Uh, We leaned heavily into planting and payoff, building moments. I mean, we really tried to make it as good as Die Hard, you know, And, and it was a Die Hard ripoff. It was Die Hard on a Train, but we we did not do it cynically. We were like, can we do something that's just as good? And we tried as hard as we could. And of course, our vision was Harrison Ford being the hero of our movie. Once it became a Steven Seagal movie, a development process kicked into gear, which it had to because Steven Seagal is not Harrison Ford. And it was like, OK, well, now that it's a Steven Seagal movie, it has to be a particular thing. It's a sequel to Under Siege and it's got a big budget. So it's got to have like big sprawling action. It can't just be him doing, you know, martial arts against other martial arts guys in an alley. But there's got to be some of that, too. And it's got to be written in a way where the Steven Seagal persona makes sense. And the character we wrote was not Steven Seagal. Right. So a process kicked into place. Brian Helglin did a rewrite. Jonathan Lemkin did a rewrite. Mitchell Kapner did a rewrite. A bunch of people came in. Some of them took the... Uh, 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 Took the movie backwards in terms of, you know, making it a a just a machine that delivers action joy, which is what we wrote. Some of the rewrites took it away backwards. Some of it took it side. Some of it took it a little forward. But mostly what they all did was somehow try to figure out how to make it a Stephen Seagal movie, which is what you needed to do. And ultimately what you see structurally in terms of the things that happen in the order that they happen according to the story and the plot, that's me and Matt. Um, the tone changed, 
a lot of the actual physicalization of action scenes. Scenes were, were just like, okay, this is no longer a clever action sequence. This is now two guys fighting in a room. Okay. Um, those were those changes. That was my experience on that movie. 30 years on, people love that movie. I enjoy watching it. It's gained this weird sort of cult uh, kind of like oddity respect sort of thing. And that's great. That aside, now you got Mothman Prophecies. Mothman Prophecies is this movie tonally and word-wise, my lines, this is 95% my first draft. When it was made late 90s, early 2000s, that's unheard of. I was not a known screenwriter. I was not on set. I was not a director. I had no, I had no claim. There was no reason to give my script any respect whatsoever, except that the director liked it. He was the one who read 10 drafts, 10 rewrites by who knows what different writers. I've never read them, read all of them, and then scraped off the top nine, went back to my original draft and said, this is the one I like. This is the movie I'll make. Now, was I on set? No, never, never got anywhere near the set. I had one phone call with Mark Pellington before he went into pre-production, where he basically said what I just told you and said, love your script, need you to trust me, I'm going to go make your movie. And I was like, all right, what am I going to say? No. You know, so he went and did it. And during the time the movie was being made every day, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It's probably being destroyed. In, I would say, early 2001, um, I was invited down to um, the uh, Lakeshore offices because they had some footage. And they're like, you should see some scenes from the movie or at least some dailies. So I went down there and I was terrified. I was like, okay, I'm going to see stuff I don't recognize at all. And I went and what I saw were for there was maybe 20 minutes, half an hour of material, my lines, my scenes, my tone. And I remember looking at them and going, okay, well, if they did that scene, then that means that these other four scenes have to have also been shot because that scene wouldn't exist. So those other ones must be safe. It was literally like counting hostages. Like, okay. Okay. Now that line. Okay. So if they use that line, that means that they've got the one that sets it up and then the one that pays it off later. Okay. So that stuff is safe. By the time I left that day, I'm like, okay, if this is for real, I'm going to get 80% of my movie. And then when they finally showed it to me, I was like, oh, I got a lot more than 80%. I got almost a hundred percent. And again, that's unheard of. Most movies go through a really crazy development cycle that y you really don't know what's going to happen when that movie comes out the other side. So I got really lucky and I was happy with the movie then and I'm even happier with it now. So how do, how does that feel having, you know, had the under siege experience and I'm sure it's just kind of just the way the industry works. You create something, you push it out of the nest and let, let it go fly off and see what it becomes. How does that feel when you see your creation kind of be what you intended it to be. It, it, it was the most um, important thing that um, might still be the most important thing that's ever happened in my career, not only for my career, but for me as a human being. Um, and I didn't realize it fully at the time, although I mostly realized it. I realize it even more now that when you as a writer write something that is then represented on the screen, you are being validated as an artist in such a powerful way that that it um it it i want to say it sort of buys back your soul i know a lot of writers who have written things that have been made that are not what they wrote and it chips away at you and i i know other people who've just never had the opportunity at all they've written other things for other people but their work has never really seen the light of day which means their voice and their soul and their you know their blood <laughs> has not found its way to the audience for which it was intended. And that is such a powerful thing when that happens. There's a lot of talk about this today, and I think people get it wrong, about representation and um, voices that were not heard, because it feels like it's all political. It feels like, well, oh, okay, so you're just banging a political drum so that you know whatever group you're with gets representation. It's totally personal. It's personal. When your story and your truth is allowed to exist side by side with other voices that for the past hundred years have been overwhelmingly those of white men, not only does it validate you as an individual human being, and yes, 
maybe there's a group of people, a, a class of people, a, a country, an ethnicity, a an orientation of people that go, also, that's also my story. But for the artists themselves, this is what allows you to get up off the ground and say, it's worth it. I can do this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And and these it, it supercharges you to tell more stories. Yeah. And as and and as most writers know and most artists know and you guys know, if you want to tell a universal story, tell an intensely personal story. It feels counterintuitive. It's like, well, yeah, but my specific experience can't possibly but it is. It is the experience of other people. And the more personal and idiosyncratic it is, when people recognize that stuff, a bond is made. And and again, not only is it powerful for the person doing it, but then for the audience you're reaching, they feel that you have seen them. And now their story and their life has been validated and is worth something. And if they decide to then turn around, maybe, and become an artist, a writer, a director, a musician, an actor, then they continue the cycle. And it's a cycle that brings people together and connects us as human beings. And that's why all of these mediums are so powerful. So it's something like the Mothman prophecies, and you kind of mentioned, you know, going on on to make something deeply personal that allows it to connect directly more broadly. I mean, in, in your approximation, in your opinion, did you succeed in that terms with Mothman and, and in your words, what is what are those moments in Mothman that you wanted to stand out or that you were using personal experiences to mine? Because, I mean, obviously the film is quote, based on the book by John Keel, but the book by John Keel, to adapt that book is like, uh, it's like adapting Naked Lunch. It's like, I don't know how you're, right. at, like, it's it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. narratively set up the, the, the source materials not to tell a through line has a narrative and character story any more than Naked Lunch is, which I think, you know, that's what drives this question. But where, where do you kind of, where did you place your own personal stuff and how much of that was just also when you were looking at the, the source material, noticing that it might have also been there? Okay, so the story that I've told in the past is... um is part of the answer. Now, to be very, very clear, I have never had a supernatural experience. So right. in a particular way, I was not saying, hey, I want to I want to share with you a supernatural experience that I've had. What I have had is a lifetime of reading, studying, thinking, wondering about these experiences that people do have and and wondering what that feels like and what it would really be like. And for a long time in my youth, I thought, well, it'd be the greatest thing in the world to have a supernatural experience of any kind would tell you that that the four walls of of rationalist, reductionist, materialist philosophy is it, it crumbles. And once you once you bring down, once you even have a crack in one of those walls, now you've got a way out. And now you've got room to speculate on a range of things. So I thought that would be so great. If I could just see a ghost, I could make to see something, a UFO, then I would know this is not all there is. And suddenly the sky's the limit and and everything and anything is possible. Well, that event never happened and that's okay. But at the time when I was thinking a lot of this stuff for the first time and really trying to figure out what what do people, when they have these experiences, what does it do to them? And that was the story I wanted to tell because I'm like, well, there's many movies about haunted houses and all kinds of things, but but they tend to be, at a certain point, they, they, they have to fulfill a plot. It's like, well, you know, there's a body in the basement, there's bones, it's, there's a murder, we're going to catch the murderer, you know, we're, you know, the, the person who's possessed will now be unpossessed. It becomes, the concerns become quite material. And I'm like, you know, in real life, when you read about people who have supernatural experiences, none of that happens. They have a very strange experience and they never figure it out. And I thought, is it possible to do a haunted house movie where a guy moves into a house, it's haunted, and then he does every smart thing you've ever hoped a character would do? He sets up cameras. He b brings over people. He records all the phenomena. He brings a priest in and has the place exercised. But he brings a scientist in and has all the gases measured. You know, is he hallucinating? Every single smart thing you can do and none of it solves what's going on. And it never gets resolved. 
And that's it. Because that's what really happens. These things do not get resolved, no matter how hard you try. Right. So I thought, is there a way to do that? And I, you know, I played around with it. I, I didn't write a word. I just was always thinking about it. But in the year before I found the book, this was really boiling around in my head. And then one day I found the book and I read the back of the book, the Illuminate Press copy. And the back of the book basically said, yeah, here's all these things that happened that would make a great movie. <laughs> right. You know, and they were like, you know, they're trying to sell their book, but they're like this, you know, this paranormal classic, you know, written 20 years ago, you know you know, is the weirdest thing you're ever going to read. And, and it, it culminates in, in, in a shocking conclusion. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> so I bought the book and I read it. And of course, anyone who's read the book, your first reaction is John Keel, his voice. Unlike any voice writing in the, in the field of true paranormal, it is so engaging, so entertaining, so funny, so propulsive, so scary. And his mind just jumps from thing to thing to thing, which is why you say it's like naked lunch. I mean, there's there's a progression of events, but there's just so much crazy shit going on. Right. It's that line. It's just like the stream of consciousness continuing. And it's like, he's just going. And but that's yeah. kind of like you said, like there's very few voices like, well, you know, Burroughs as well, similarly, because like, I, I mean, maybe I think that way, but I definitely don't write that way. And writing that way, being able to externalize the internal is it like the internalized thing is very hard but those who can do it it's like holy shit like a john keel or a, or a burroughs yeah yeah and i thought well there's so much here the job isn't going to be really inventing phenomenon it's going to be basically just clearing stuff away so that one one sort of through line remains what's happening in point pleasant and just getting enough to bring him through and then and then the next thing was making it emotional, giving it. So the th stuff I invented was the personal stuff, the relationship, the wife. He was never married. Um, you know, the, the you know, reflection on, on sort of the existential questions that are posed by death and the death of a loved one. So all of that stuff was like, and again, you know, I mean, that's any Stephen King novel does that, you know, on the first 50 pages. So it's like th th it was these were craft decisions that would allow me to deliver this story. But at the same time, because it was a nonfiction book, I my entire desire was to convince the reader that I have found a book that you've never heard of where things happened in real life that you're not going to fucking believe. And when I, when I wrote the screenplay, I actually wrote an author's note that was the first page that preceded the title page even, I think. And and it basically said the events in this screenplay are true. The time frame has been updated. Some there's been a compression of you know the, the 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 span of the narrative, and some names have been changed. But the phenomena took place. It's happened all over the world for thousands of years, and the events have never been explained. And I wanted people to know that when they started to read the screenplay, so they go in with that feeling of really. And then I wanted the first. 20 or 30 pages of the screenplay to not have anything really that scary at all. Just really feel like, oh, these are just real people buying a house, going to work, doing their thing. And John Klein slowly becomes more and more enmeshed in the paranormal and tries to figure it out. So the, anyway, th that was my whole thrust with getting this done. The, quest, the personal questions I wanted to address were, can you answer these questions conclusively? Are these questions things you can answer? And my feeling was that they are not questions you can answer. And that in trying to pin them down, you drive yourself crazy. This is not the sort of thing that might ever be fully pinned down. And can we be okay with that? And at the same time, not dismiss it completely. Can we accept ambiguity in our lives? Can we accept living with the question? That's what I wanted to do. That it's not a Friday night at the movies, let's go get a tub of popcorn and a pizza and then go home and make out in the car. You know, it's like people want a monster and they want to fight and they want to see the monster killed. So I was shooting at a very narrow target. And, uh, and that was, and I knew it when I wrote it, I knew it. So that's when Dustin and I watched it last night, that was something that we were both kind of commenting on. And I, I want, I wanted to ask you about it. And I think this ties directly into the idea of the Mothman as both obviously a character in the film being represented by your script and John Keel's book, but also like, again, 
Mothman broadly, right? Like just the Mothman and the phenomenon surrounding it. Um, how how important was it to have a Mothman in the movie, or was that a thing that had to be added at some point? Because because I think for Dustin and I, one of the things that I think, and I think not not that we're you know sitting here and going, well, we know how to do it better, but. I think what would have worked in the, I think what one of the things that may have actually helped the movie in the long run, but I think it would have hurt the movie for the audiences at the time, just based on what you're saying is it could have stood to have been a lot vaguer, but the audiences, <laughs> the audiences would have fucking hated that yeah. at the time. But like now it's, so it's somewhat okay. You can make movies that are even more ambiguous and vague. And I think people embrace that more in 2024. I mean, people's filmmaking. Film viewing tastes have changed so drastically. And, and I mean, not really, maybe not even drastically, but they've definitely caught up with things that are asking them to ask more of themselves and the things that they're watching. Because that's the thing about your movie. It's asking a lot of the audience, which, like you said, mo- a, a movie and we watch the trailer for it. They don't even know how to advertise the movie because like it's not a horror movie. But it is. And it's not a thriller, but it is. It's like more of a lot of things kind of all at once. So like how how, I guess my question to you is how important was it to hew to the real story of the Mothman, but also bring your own spin to the story via you and John Keel? Well, I wasn't worried about representing the events in Point Pleasant in 1965, 66, 67. That was not my interest at right, all. Right. And and I, I purposely uh, changed the facts of the case so that it, it was, was sort of made overtly clear to anyone. You know, the very first thing you would ask is, well, how many people died on that bridge? And it's very easy to know the number. And I gave the wrong number because I wanted to make it clear that that on no level was I trying to tell the real story because real people died. And, y- you know, you're dealing with the, the lives of relatives who are still alive. And I, I wanted to make it clear I'm not just getting it wrong or, you know, if I tried a little more, it would have been worse because they would have said, well, you 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 had a character named this and you, and you had that character named that. So I changed everyone's names and I, you know, anyway, my... My goal with the script was to was to answer a question, but not answer the question. And this was one part of the movie that I think could have possibly worked a little better. I uh, the the by the way, the bridge collapse is amazing. I, I think it's one of the most incredible things I've ever seen on film because it feels real. It does not feel like oh, okay, so this was designed in a computer and we're watching computerized images. It really feels physical, and it is. Much of it is. That having been said, in the screenplay, w- what is made very evident is that many of the things that happened in the movie that were just weird and kind of odd and mysterious get answered. So, like, there's sound effects. It's like, oh, every time there's this weird, you know, shrieking sound on the phone, and you realize later, oh, that's the sound of the cables twisting. And, oh, there's other, the weird visuals of the the red and green lights sort of tumbling through the sky that people think are UFOs. And then it's like, oh, no, that's that's the police car tumbling through the air and then sinking through the water. And the impression you're supposed to get is that there was a voice in the universe that was trying to issue a warning, but could not speak our language. And so it was using sounds and images and and weird reference points to say something's going to happen. It was trying to warn us. It just didn't have the words. And then the thing happens and it, it, it could never have been stopped. That to me would have sort of said, Oh, okay. So that the, the things that we saw that didn't make sense ultimately sort of made sense. But, but it's only when John Klein gives up. It's only when he's like, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm just going to, I've made my decision. I'm no longer going to try to figure out the answer to any of this. I'm going to go back to Point Pleasant, go to Connie's house and have Christmas Eve. The minute he makes that decision, the entire universe just tilts and opens up every single doorway in front of him. Every doorway that's been shut. He's been banging his head against every doorway. None of the doors open. The minute he decides to stop looking at the thing, but look over here, everything coalesces into he. And again, this is in the script, not in the movie. He goes, there's no, you know, there's no flights. Oh, wait, there is a flight. Yeah, there's one seat left. Great, I'll take it. He lands, you know, in in Ohio. He's like, I need a rental car. I'm driving to Point Pleasant. I'm sorry, it's Christmas Eve. There's no rental cars. Wait, there is a rental car. Someone comes up. Oh, there, oh there's one. You can have one. Every single thing 
opens up allowing him to be on the bridge when the disaster happens so that he can save Connie. That's it. That's what the universe wanted. Once he took his eye off the ball, he was able to achieve his actual goal, which is re-enter the human race. Step out of the fog of grief, reapproach actual life, and that's the answer. The answer is Connie. And once he understood that, he was able to effectively act. Every other question for the bulk of the movie that he was trying to answer and figure out are questions no human being is ever going to figure out. And so at a certain point, you got to set those aside. And that's, you know, what's funny, Richard, when when you talk about it that way, the idea of the moth man in the movie, right? And again, like the, the character of Indrid Cold is given a voice and we see them at one point ostensibly. Um, and, and I like the idea that we get to see them. And I like, you know, you kind of going further as to exactly say what the purpose of, of the character is. I think it's interesting because, again, like for for me as an audience member watching the movie for the 15th time or whatever it is at this point because that's the i mean that's the weird thing in a lot of ways like you and i are friends uh because of something that has nothing to do with the mothman you reaching out to mike and i and saying you like something that we worked on so i've never blown smoke up your ass about the mothman like it's something that i've I- enjoyed despite despite all of the issues i'm sure you think it has or that it does have or whatever i enjoy it and even though it's it's probably my favorite richard gear movie and i don't like richard gear at all like he i find him to be just for me he's his acting style and the things that i've seen him in don't resonate with me but i understand that he resonates with a lot of other people that being said you mentioned this idea and like it it comes back to you know what i was thinking about when i watched this movie every time which is if he didn't leave immediately when the phone rang she would have died the end that's the way i mean right like you said like the, the idea of and I think it would have been really great to have those scenes of like, oh my God, like it's just that one. There is one and it's just you got the one and that's the universe telling you like you needed to be there. You had to be there. But like at the end of the day, if he sat and talked on the phone to his wife, quote unquote, for any amount of time, the way the movie chronologically sets it up, she would have died. Right. And, that's, and you know, and look, th- th- there was a lot going on in Point Pleasant. There were UFOs. There was the Mothman. There were men in black. There were there were uh, there were there was poltergeist phenomenon in people's homes. Um, there were uh, these strange phone calls. People were having precognitive dreams. I mean, there was the whole range of supernatural um, s- phenomenon going on that that you know you try to fit all the puzzle pieces and you can't. There's just there's, and as well there was you know John Keel had a big imagination. He was making some of that stuff up. He may have been, but at a certain point, it's like well. He wasn't making it all up. I mean, there was a lot going on. There were people who were witnessing things. And it's funny, the Mothman, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to show the Mothman. I mean, that's just not really ever going to happen. And what is the role of the Mothman? And the people who saw it emotionally were, it was terrifying. They, they, They had an emotional reaction to what they were seeing that had nothing to do with what they were seeing. There's all kinds of scary things you can see, but people, when this thing got near, they, they experienced a feeling of dread. Um, and But in a weird way, that that character, the Mothman, was the least interesting. But I thought, okay, once I started telling the story, and because the Mothman is sort of unknowable, I'm like, well, maybe there's a way to do this where if you see the Mothman, you're going to die. That can be a thing. I can do that. People who see the Mothman will later die. And you won't know it until... After you see the movie, you see it a second time, maybe a third time. It's like, oh, anyone who saw it died and in various ways. So I'm like, okay, well, that's a use. And, and thematically, that fits because that is how the town felt. Once this stuff really started happening, it's very hard for human beings to go, well, okay, just a lot of weird stuff actually is happening. The very next question always is, what does it mean? What are we supposed to do about it? Why is it happening to us? Why are we chosen? What's happening? So and it usually feels bad because if you see something and it's scary, you're like, I think something bad is going to happen. There was a lot of fear and a lot of paranoia in in the city at the time. And and Keel reports about that and talks about that. And and then when the bridge collapses, yeah, it could be a coincidence, but there really was, that was the end of the reports of strange phenomenon in Point Pleasant from then until now. It just really has not continued to be a, a hotbed. So who knows? You know, the, the the people in the the people in the town don't their reaction to the book isn't, well, John Keel's a big city slicker who came down here and made fools of us honest town folk. They're like, no, he reported what we told him and 
He did his best to be accurate. You know, they stand by their stories. So to that degree, the Mothman showed up, other stuff happened, a bad thing happened. That was the end of that. I never really took the Mothman very seriously until, I don't know, about six or seven years ago when stuff started happening in Chicago. And those sightings have convinced me that there is a supernatural phenomenon called seeing a large winged humanoid because the people reacted to it with fear. People are seeing it. There's many more reports around Chicago than there ever were in Point Pleasant. Mothman is now something I associate with Chicago and the O'Hare Airport environs much more than Point Pleasant. Um, It's been seen dozens of times, described in the same way, and people stand by their stories. So let's let's take that tangent for a second. We'll come back to Mothman prophecies, but to talk about the Mothman broadly here, um, Dustin and I were actually talking about that last night when we were watching the movie. Dustin mentioned to me the Chicago sightings, but I mean, again, and 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 you know, I've asked you this privately, but I feel like this is a question that I can get away with asking you on podcasts, which is, you're now the Mothman, right? Like it was, if John Keel was still around, which he's not, it would be him on Twitter. But I think when people interact with you on Twitter, they're like, hey, it's Richard Haddam. It's the Mothman. He's the Mothman guy. And like, but that, but like, <laughs> is that a, is that a bad thing? I personally don't think so. I mean, look, you made, I like I was telling Dustin last night, there are how many movies about aliens and other things. There's how many movies about all poltergeist and everything else. How many movies are there about the Mothman? Yours, like really? No, nobody will well, touch it except Richard Haddam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people think I'm the Moth Man. I think people think I'm the Moth Man prophecies movie man. There are <laughs> wow. There are other, you know, there, I mean, in terms of if you're interested in the in the phenomenon, there's Lauren Coleman. There's sure. Um, um, uh, I mean, I mean, I can go get the books. Off to be fair, I think of Lauren that. Coleman more as a Bigfoot guy than as a Moth Man guy. Me personally. Well, yeah, but then there's uh, Tobias Wayland. Wayland. I always get his name wrong, but um, he's written. He's written several books and um But to uh, be fair, you I mean, like I also say that because Richard, you have kept up with the information about the Mothman. Like, don't sell yourself short. Like, you know about the Mothman well, too. You know what I mean? Like well, I, but only because you know. people ask. <laughs> so <laughs> I, mean, I have to go read the books of the experts so that I have I can go, oh, go read this Tobias's book. Go read uh, Lauren's book. Go fair. to Lon Strickler's, you know, uh website and and keep up with with the the reports as they get reported. Um, but people have come to me and said, so what do you think? So what is the Mothman? And, and I'm, well, A, I don't know that, that I'm the wrong guy to ask. I've, I've got, you know, theories and ideas about ghosts and UFOs and stuff, but Mothman is, is, is a tough one. I mean, I can read books about near-death experiences and alien abduction, and there's all kinds of things that can be talked about and people can form theories about. Really, the Mothman seems to be a thing that shows up, scares the hell out of people, and then leaves. The end. So what is going on in Chicago, Richard? That that was the that that was the other part of the question. So what did now it's for, so t- I mean look, I know. So um uh oh god, I, I feel like I should grab the book. Um Tobias Wayland's book, The Lake Michigan Mothman. Now I'm showing it to you. There it is. There it is. Okay. Tobias is a guy who has thought about this way more than I have. I've I've talked to him a little bit. You know, we're sort of Twitter friends, but um, which, here's the one of the more interesting parts of the book, and and it's you know it's written in a very clear-eyed sort of okay. Here are the reports. Here are what the people are saying. Let me tell you a little bit about the area. So here's the funny thing: in the years before these sightings happened, but just you know just previous to it, the um the sort of uh, climate topography around O'Hare Airport changed and became much more swampy. And it became a a place that large, um, for, for want of a better phrase, sandhill cranes and other large winged egrets started to live. We know and a thing or two about sandhill cranes. That's a those are native to Nebraska. Mm, okay. Western Nebraska has a huge sandhill crane migration thing, right, Dustin? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And y- you know there are there are large birds, and there are and and when you see a large bird or an owl. And you're not expecting it. It can be shocking. And and if it's if it's out of place, if it's not something that's seen all the time, then y- people react and well, what did I just see? So the strange thing is that these birds began to 
live in the area of the sightings just before a lot of the sightings were reported. Okay. And Tobias talks about it. Doesn't hide from that, but he but it's that thing of, okay, it is very odd. These large birds move in, but now people are reporting things, some of which sound like the birds, but some of which sound like they are distinctly some other thing. Now, why is that? And why is it happening in that one place? Now, are, is it just that some people are completely misrepresenting what they're seeing? And it literally would be along the lines of, instead of thinking you saw a deer, you thought you saw a, a 10-foot tall, four-legged, red-eyed beast, you know, with... It's like, well, wait a second. You can't misinterpret it that hard. You can't misinterpret it that hard. But it, it's so frustrating and yet so classically Fortean that that there's always the O oh, except for that one thing that makes it very difficult to say this is definitely a supernatural thing. And it happens all it's almost like there's a trickster figure on the one hand going, oh, this will be hilarious. Right. Let's make sure the Mothman sightings take place in a place where large birds have recently taken up residence and it's gonna fuck with everyone. Okay. Or the phenomenon itself is like, oh, we can go here now because we can move about undisturbed. There's already large birds. Maybe we won't be as noticed. But the fact remains, some people report seeing the large birds and other people report seeing a human figure that looks like it's been punched out of a hole in the universe with glowing red eyes, giant wings, and when it takes off, it makes a sound like, uh, you know, a bus slamming on the brakes, a loud screeching noise that these birds don't make. Just enough for debunkers to go, well, you have your answer, but not enough for the people who had the experience who say, well, no, that simply isn't what I saw. So I guess in your mind, and you mentioned it in terms of comparisons to the Mothman sightings that drive the narrative in the in the movie that you wrote, Chicago is now where the Mothman has taken up roost for a while, permanently, uh, yeah. for, for the foreseeable future? Well, I don't think there's one of anything. I don't think there is a big foot. I right. think there are Agreed. many, you know, and Moth I don't men. think- Mothmen. Mothmen. I, I think they are, I think they are sometimes physical, but they- are not always as, yeah. I mean, I know, look, and now we're not really talking about the movie. We're talking about people having supernatural experiences. If you look at the entirety of witness reports the, and you're, and you're just, you know, physical evidence sometimes and, and eyewitness reports, what you would be left with is in terms of most Bigfoot sightings and certainly all Mothman sightings and many UFO sightings is something is seen it becomes gradually more physical. It can interact with the environment. It can interact with people in ways that we don't understand. And then it can disappear very quickly, sometimes in a way that makes it seem like the thing is becoming less physical in our reality. So <clears throat> are these things that, you know, are, do they move in and out of dimensions? Do they have ways to get in and ways to get out? That's what it feels like. That's what people seem to report. And Maybe one day we'll understand what that mechanism is and if that is indeed what's happening. Well, that's when Dustin and I were watching it last night. That was one of the things that we were kind of talking about is the idea of the Mothman being like a, I guess if, if you were to put a term to it, would it be like ultra terrestrial? Like able to walk yeah. around like in it, less about traveling space, but more traveling time in between or the spaces in between time and space. I guess yeah, I, I, it's not we don't I mean, if we don't even understand the concept of how these things are being, there's no way that we could explain it to ourselves unless we happened upon it by pure accident. Well, I was just going to say there was uh, something I watched the uh, on the trail, of the Mothman Lake Michigan documentary, which you ended up being on it when I was watching it. <laughs> it was the uh, Breed Love documentary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. Love, yeah. Oh, great. That's a great one. Yeah. And. Somebody on there was talking about a sighting of the Mothman, and it was almost like it was in a strobe light as it was moving. And I thought that was an interesting way to describe it and kind of what you guys are saying, like how it can move about. Like it's not it's not like us. It's moving through our time and space much differently. That's so I love that description, by the way, like it's flickering yeah. a little bit and it's you know, it's it's not quite holding its its. um physical form uh but it's trying and then it and then it recedes 
Um, there's a there's a a kind of sense that this makes. You know, I, I think in talking about these subjects from the '70s, from the days of In Search of to tonight, there's been a movement of breaking down the walls between them, between ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, all these things. And once you do that, you realize, oh, these things overlap all the time, but they're often left out of stories because the people collecting them are focused in a particular field. So people collecting UFO stories will tend to leave out details when a person tells their UFO story and says, but right before we saw the UFO, we saw this Bigfoot creature because they're like, well, look, I have enough trouble getting people to take my UFO report seriously. Now, if I add in that you saw Bigfoot, they're not going to listen to any of this. So I'm going to cut out the Bigfoot part, but I'm going to talk about the UFO part, and we're going to compile it with other UFO reports and and try to um, put forth a case that these things, you know, there's similarities in the reports, and so there may be something to study. But if we start throwing in Bigfoot, no one's going to listen to a fucking word we say. Again, they, they barely listen now. Whitley Strieber and his wife Anne, when they were getting letters from people after he wrote Communion, they were getting letters from people, and so many of them said, Oh, on the spaceship with the aliens when I was abducted, I saw my dead relatives. Well, now that's really weird, and that's still really weird, but they're absolutely convinced that the UFO phenomenon is directly connected to what happens to us after we die. Hmm. All of these things suddenly, when when you listen to entire reports and you re- they become more alike, and suddenly you're like, oh, it's it's ghosts and it's UFOs that that act like ghosts. They're here, then they're gone. Bigfoot is there, then gone. Tracks lead. No- I mean, there's you know maybe that's the reason we've never found a Bigfoot body because Bigfoot isn't an actual animal. It is more associated with ghosts or UFOs. So so this has become a Something that people can talk about in a way I don't think they could even 20 years ago. Well, I was just going to say, I mentioned to Chris uh, last night, much in the way that like I can think of like when Carl Sagan was explaining in a 2D world how a 3D object would be perceived in a 2D world. They wouldn't see it as 3D. It would just be, see, be seen as this intersection, this line in their 2D world, you know, as it moves through the 2D world. They would they have no concept of 3D. So... Right bring that into what we're talking about, like a 4D world, let's say, intersecting with our 3D world, just as a, a an analogy to what we're talking about. You know, these these uh, beings, Mothman, Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, is it just that what people are experiencing, these little glimpses of something intersecting with the 3D world, our world, and then moving out of it? Yes, and the other question that I always have in all of this, including with the Mothman, and I, I mean, this comes back to something that's talked about in your movie, Richard, it, uh, you know, the the book, I think, approaches that a little differently, but the character of Richard Gere's character, John Klein, in the movie, he's meant to be John Keel from the book, he talks to the Mothman on the phone. He interacts with him directly. Well, he talks to Indrid Cole. Right, Indrid Cole, who... Again, I guess the question becomes... Who's who, Indrid Cold? Well, who is Indrid Cold, right? Like, <laughs> if Indrid Cold is not the Mothman, how is Indrid Cold no. something else, right? Well, they talk about that different frequency, too, in the movie. Yeah. Indrid Cold is uh, Mothman's manager. <laughs> it's his front man. He comes in, makes sure the hotel room is right. He's the hype guy sure for the Mothman. The, the green M&Ms have all been taken out. Right. You know? He checks in, he works, he sort of is the liaison between Mothman and the label. That's, I mean, but that's the thing, like, Indrid, so that's that's one of the things about the movie that I've always wondered about and I've never asked you about. And again, John Keel's book is one thing, but having you as a source of knowledge is another. The The relationship between Indrid Cold has been talked about. The relationship between Indrid Cold and Mothman has been talked about plenty. I mean, one of the things, Richard, that I know you've watched and I watched as well was Hellier. And they talk about Indrid Cold a lot, in hell you're like if not uh, injured cold being the focus of that show he kind of ends up being the focus for like a a swath of episodes in that show but how important was it for you to represent injured cold and the mothman a- as again like separate entities but of a same possible path yeah like they're like you know mothman kicked the door open and then injured cold slipped through and you know a right. ufos and you know some ghosts um well, Indrid Cole to me was so interesting because it was there was a it was more of a character, you know. It was like it talks it, his dialogue, it talks dialogue. A, a, a person see it, it's like oh, this is you know this is really interesting. And what was 
really interesting to me about Injured Cold was this sense that it was a thing that was taking a human form, but it was having trouble getting all the details right. To me, that's the scariest thing in the world. And and one of the things that I, I wanted to put across in in the movie was not that really any of these things were evil. They're not evil. You know, a great white shark isn't evil. A black widow spider is not evil. We're afraid of it. It can hurt us, but it has no moral um, motive. Insect politics. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. It does what it does. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a rattlesnake. Sorry. Yeah. What did you expect Um, me not to sting you? Yeah. And I love the notion that, um, that that's what we were dealing with here. That injured cold, these aren't demons. This isn't something that, you know, um, and, the, and the, really the only thing in the movie that I don't like is when injured cold on the phone says, I know what scares you because I'm like, no, that's, that's not, he's trying not to scare you. That's a demon thing. Yeah. The, the, I know what scares you is sort of like, oh, so these are like evil demons that are coming. And it's like, no, they're scary because they're different. Right. It's that uncanny Valley. It's the thing that's trying to be human. That's coming up and going, Hi, how are you? Don't be a fire of me. And you're like, what the fuck? You know, I like, it's the scariest thing in the world. And it's wearing a Richard suit. Yeah. It's like, and it's, you know, trying to walk and, you know, it's like grinning constantly. And you're like, you know, what the fuck? So to me, that was really scary. And I, and I was like, that's better because I don't want it. The, the minute it's evil, then the narrative becomes, well, we're good. Therefore battle. Therefore we win. And I'm like, I, I it was so hard to try to maintain a narrative and thematic through line that did not do anything to trigger those feelings in the audience of, oh, now I understand. Now I know who the bad guy is, the good guy is. The bad guy is the world. In in Mothman Prophecies, the bad guy is things happen that we don't understand. Sometimes it's a brain tumor. Sometimes it's a Mothman. Good night, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Another fun night at the movies. (laughs) Thanks to Richard Haddam. <laughs> well, and that's and that's the thing that you mentioned about, you know, the injured cold character in the movie not being perceived as evil. And I think that is important, obviously, because, again, like I've mentioned kind of at the top here, I think your movie was ahead of its time in a lot of ways, because, again, like the Mothman now is no is is no I don't know. It's like it's not something that's unknown. Like it's not an unknown. I'm not saying in 2002 it was un- unknown, but Mothman is more known now than it ever has been. Right. Like. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, when I think of Mothman Prophecies, I really think about your movie as like, it was made at a time and a place for an audience that was never going to appreciate it anyways, in a lot of ways. Right. Like, the the real questions at the center of the movie are finally more acceptable to be talked about publicly in the present more than it has been before. I mean, like you said, I mean, this is oh, a this is yeah. mainstream now. Like this is a mainstream yeah. way of doing things, which is making a movie about it. Like this is a mainstream way of approaching the topic. They just did it 20 years too early or 10, probably 15 years too early, honestly. You know, I um I and I made the mistake of thinking, well, there will be critics that will understand this. They'll go, oh, okay. The movie's called The Mothman Prophecies, but what the movie is really about, is, and then they would then they would explain my thesis, and they would go, good job. None of them did. Every last one of them was like, this is garbage. This is stupid. This is, um, is a, you know, it, a movie that doesn't know what it is. It, 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 it ends, it takes the easy way out by answering a question it never asked. It's, um, it's, it's boring. It tries, it, it's foolish. It wants us to take something seriously that is absurd. It's, th- this is, you know, there's some nice performances and boy, Mark Pellington does everything he can with a shitty screenplay, but blah, blah, blah. And it was sort of like, oh, so the part they got right was it's atmospheric. Mark Pellington does a beautiful job. Acting is great. Um, but I, I, in retrospect, I don't know why I expected anything different because these are the kinds of questions that movies just don't deal with that, that most fiction doesn't deal with the, the uncanny, you, the sort of like, oh, we're something strange happened and we're not going to get an answer. It's just, it's weirdly taboo because these experiences have been so thoroughly ridiculed by certain voices in our culture, mostly self-appointed skeptics. And, and then, and then otherwise, you know, sort of righteous spokespeople for science, like Carl Sagan, sort of feel it's their duty to say, well, all of this other stuff is just stupid bullshit and 
you you should not no one should even be thinking about it you just 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 go take a science class and learn what reality is and and yet the people who have had the experiences not me they're the ones saying i'm not banging a drum for any cause something happened to me i'm telling you what happened and I'm going to science with my arms wide and saying, what happened? And they're kicking me in the nuts. Well, guess I shouldn't be talking about that anymore. I wrote with my left hand and the teacher slapped me with a ruler. Guess I better not write with my left hand anymore. And it's sort of like, wait, hold on a second. Is this really our best approach to literally thousands of years of people having experiences? And you know what? If you want to come up and tell me exactly, it's like, oh, you know what? It turns out it's this disease. It's like bipolar. Oh, it's this thing. It's like schizophrenia. It's like, yo, know, we figured it out. It's a brain imbalance with this chemical and that chemical. And you really want to do it and prove it and give medicine to the people who are alien abductees and suddenly they're fine again. Or you want to explain it some other way that there's some sort of natural phenomenon that that provokes hallucinations of a very particular kind. By all means, bring it on. I don't care. If there's an explanation and we can get to it and it makes sense, but anything other than the lazy, lazy ridicule that serves no one but a bunch of guys hanging out at the Magic Castle, you know, feeling superior to everyone else for absolutely no reason at all. Yeah, I think, and we talked about it a little bit ago, and I guess tell me if this is kind of what your formula for the movie was but we kind of talked about it where go, going through the movie it kind of presents it presents the mothman as it is this thing that exists but then there's little parts of the movie that make you question that like or is it or is it just this thing that's happening and like we we, we saw when we were watching the movies there's all these introductions of dual red lights everywhere everywhere like throughout the whole movie which i thought was really fun to kind of spot <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, that was one of the things Mark did a great job of. And also that there's this um, sort of a great, it's almost like a Y. It's like a line yeah. with another line off it that sort of is a, a visual motif that gets sort of woven in and out. The mark of the Mothman. Yeah, kind of the mark of the Mothman. So yeah, I mean, it, it it's constantly sort of tipping its hat to, you know, oh, wait, what did I just see? Wait, what did I just see? I don't think it was in there to say, oh, this is what they're seeing. I think the movie is trying to train you to look for stuff, get primed. And then go, oh my God, what? A oh, no, that's just taillights. Was that kind of the concept of what you're going for? Where like the, the movie's presenting it as like the Mothman is this thing that everybody's experiencing or is it? Well, I want it to be, I mean, look, I, I, I you know, you, if Mark Pellington was on with us, we could get his sort of approach to the visuals and, and kind of what he was saying. And it's funny because mm -hmm. I never got an opportunity to sit down and have these discussions with him that that it was just sort of like, yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm sort of doing my thing and then he's doing his thing and they tend to match up and okay, that's cool. And in the time since the movie's been made, I still haven't had a conversation with him. So I don't, I don't really, I, I can't answer for him in terms of those visual flourishes. But what I, what I can say is that I, I respect it personally for what it does. Cause that's what I think it does. But, but on the, on the page, my intention was there was another moment in the script that that doesn't really play out in the movie, but there's it's on the bridge as it's you know starting to collapse, and a guy you know is like rolls down his window and he's looking up, and the you know bridge is kind of swaying, and he looks up and he sees the Mothman. It's it's one of our clearest views in the script, and he sees it, and then we're back on his face, and then we're back where he's looking. And whatever the Mothman was is actually just sort of one of the cables. It, it's like it sort of resolves into the cable having been pulled out and it comes down and basically like slices his head off. Hmm. <laughs> the idea being, of course, that once again, you see the Mothman, then you die. So it's like, yes, he saw the Mothman. But I mean, and it's funny because the, we did have a lot of conversations uh, with the producers and even with Richard Gere, I had conversations about how people experience this stuff. And and one of the ideas, and it gets talked about in one of Keel's books, is that 
is that when people see a UFO or Mothman or whatever they're seeing, they're they're seeing an energy form from an, another dimension, something that is not typical to our physical world. And the brain doesn't know what it's seeing. And so it's flipping through and flipping through and flipping through. And it's almost like, like a Rorschach test. You're trying to figure it out really quick and figure it out and, and you sort of like land on something. And then that's what it is for a second, but that's not what it is. And even the aliens, the gray aliens with the big eyes and the big heads... Uh, in various abduction scenarios, they tell people, this is not how we look. We look this way for you, but this is not what we are. And that's always strange because I'm like, oh, because the way you look is creepy. So <laughs> this is double scary for me. It's, again, it's like, if you're doing this to make me feel better, it's not worth it. And honestly, what do you look like? Oh, you Imagine, know. right? Like cosmic terror, like you see it and you go insane. Like, Well, yeah, because because you don't, you don't know what you're looking I mean- Look, Your brain I can't people, process it at all. It, it drives itself crazy trying to process what it is. It's so hard to imagine, and it's really scary, but people who have had these experiences say there is a level of terror, wholly unique, that occurs when you are interacting with something that is not human. Right. It is an intelligence that is greater than ours. It's not human. There are no emotions. It is another species, but it's above us. And, and you hear that and you're like, oh, yeah, that is scary. But it's almost impossible to imagine what that feels like because there's nothing, really nothing like it. There's nothing comparable until that thing happens. And the people it happens to, it, 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 it changes them. They're very convinced. They know what they experienced. And you, typically, they don't want to talk about it. Often, they don't talk about it for years. There, right. This is not a situation where people are like, ooh, all I got to do is tell my UFO story and I'm going to make some money. People don't make money. No one's making money. Whitley Strieber's not making money. He destroyed his career as a novelist. He was making far more money before he wrote Communion than after. If he had just continued writing horror novels, he would be Dean Koontz. He'd be Stephen King. He would be living in a mansion. He's living in an apartment in Santa Monica. He is not a wealthy man. Writing Communion made money off that book, and then it destroyed his career for the last 40 years. And I hate that people think that, you know, that's the easy path is I am an author or I am a participant in this thing, and therefore someone will write a book about it, or I will, and I will make a lot of money. It's like, well, it's also, I mean, it's a completely facile argument that can be applied to anything. It's like, well, that's why Ma Michael Shermer writes his. Well, you're, you're, you're only opposing as a skeptic. You're not really a skeptic. You're just doing it to cash in and make money off skepticism right. and off the, and it, which is an absurd statement. But what the hell? As long as we're throwing around absurd statements, why not throw some back over the fence? Right. Well, yeah, and that's and that's the other thing. So you mentioned John Keel a couple times. Obviously, John Keel wrote the book on which the movie is based. You spent some time with John Keel, um, I'm sure more than just some, given that you adapted his novel. Uh, what was it like to get to work with him? And and you know, what did he think of the film after the after the the dust had settled once it had come out? Like, what was kind of what was it just like to be in the presence of someone who, again, you like you mentioned, you picked the book up and read it and realized that like this was a thing, and then at some point you're in a room meeting with this person. Like, what 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 was that like? Well, I got lucky because by approaching him the way we did, so my agent reached out to him. And said, hey, you know, I've got this writer who wants to do an adaptation of your book. And we would like to discuss terms for an option. And um, my agent went to a guy named Knox Berger, who was a big New York literary agent, represented a lot of very famous people, including John Keel. And what's really funny is if you watch Annie Hall, um, I forget the scene, but there is a scene. I think it's the one is, is like Cheryl. Is it Cheryl Ladd or Cheryl? I think Cheryl Ladd has a cameo in um, Annie Hall. But in any case, in the scene, prominent in the scene on the street of New York, on the street, you can see a big sign that says Knox Burger and Associates. Hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> there's John Keel's manager, agent, lawyer. Anyway, get in touch with that. I mean, that guy's an irascible old New Yorker. These guys are a very different generation. John Keel is, he's the Kurt Vonnegut generation. He's, he's a guy writing, you know, short pieces around the world in the 50s and short stories and trying to get published in any way he can. He's writing fiction, but he's also writing nonfiction because that's an interest of his also. But these are writers. These are proto, these are, these are guys who feel that they are journalists. And Keel was a journalist. There were so many 
what we call men's magazines, Argosy, and you know, literally dozens of them, where you could sell articles about your adventure crossing a mountain or you know, crossing a desert. Something that would appeal to male readers who would then go buy these magazines off the newsstand, and that's what Keel was doing. He was writing for those people. So he was a different generation. When I approached him and said, I want to pay you some money to option your book, he was blown away because he's like, well, this is the only time Hollywood's ever come to me through the front door. He's like, you got to understand, when the book came out in the 70s, I got a phone call one day telling me that they were making the movie in California. They were already, it was Sun Classic International was, was just making the movie. They hadn't approached me, hadn't paid me. I didn't know about it. They were making the movie. I found out about it. I told Knox Berger. He shut it down. So the very fact that I came to him and said, hi, I'm a fan of your book. I would like to pay you money and write out a contract where you'll get credit and also more money if it ever gets made. It was like I bought some credibility right? because I had no idea he'd had such a bad experience. So I thought, I think right there, I got lucky. I got led in the door to a guy who was very cynical and very alone and not very wealthy. And suddenly he was like, oh, okay. Someone can-. And I went all of my conversations with him and all of my communications with him were just like, your book is so great and your other books are so great and you're so great. And let me ask you questions. And you get to a certain age in your life and he was not getting that reaction. By that time in his life, he realized he was never going to figure out the secrets of the universe. I think for a while he thought he would, but by then he realized he wouldn't. And, and once you... Once you cross that border, your sense of humor kicks in. And he would go to these UFO conferences where people are just grinding their teeth. They're so damn serious about disclosure and alien bodies and whatever. And he would get up there and they would be waiting to hear answers and he'd start making jokes and they hated that. But he was just like, I mean, talk about no fucks left to give. He was just sort of like, guys, if you can't laugh at this, then you're missing the whole fucking point. It's fair. And his knowledge was so wide ranging that he would start talking about UFOs and then he'd start talking about devil cults and then he'd start talking about the Himalayas and then he'd start talking about poltergeists and everyone's like, no, 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 there's a UFO conference. Where are the bodies? And he's just like, that's not my gig. I didn't care less where the bodies were, even if I did know where. I tried it that way, you know, and I realized that that every trail you're sniffing down leads to nothing. And I, 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 cause I sniffed those same trails 20 years ago. So Sorry. I, I just, I, I cannot take this stuff seriously. I believe it. I believe people have experiences. I think things happen, but I, I no longer think we're within spitting distance of figuring it out. And so, so when I met him, you know, again, my passion level was very high and his was fairly low. Again, I think he, it gratified him that one of his titles was going to be a major motion picture. And he joked all the time that, you know, Richard Gere was cast because of their resemblance. Um, and he got some money, you know? And look, we all like money and certainly at his age and his generation, you know, literally getting paid, you know, pennies per word to finally see some real decent money. I think it helped him. And I think it, it, it validated him in a way. And I'm glad I'm so, I'm so glad the movie was good that, you know, a rational human being could look at that movie and go, this is respectable. This isn't garbage. And he got nothing but good stuff out of it. So, and it sold more of his books. It sold more copies of the Mothman prophecies. It it suddenly was on the charts again. So so good for him. And we remained friends and wrote letters, actual handwritten, sometimes typed letters to each other. And we talked on the phone and and were friends. And he liked being a funny, irascible, cynical guy. And was he 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 was a character and he knew it and he did not disappoint. And um and so we were friends as much as you could be friends um for the last handful of years of his life i like the uh kind of chain of events of how you mentioned earlier pellington kind of taking your screenplay and using pretty much its entirety and how validating that was and how great that felt and it was a moment in your life that you know the finest moment in your life you'll never forget and you kind of did the same thing you know for him when you said i want to turn your book into a movie pay you money and like all of a sudden he's part of this process too how va- yeah and like you said how validating it was for him like i just think that's cool like it it, it was almost like it was meant to be in true mothman prophecy form it, there was this unstoppable force that was set to happen and it happened well you know all of these things 
you know, and, and not to bring everything full circle back to my new podcast, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. <laughs> but the reason that podcasts like Scary Stories We Tell exist and and all the other ones where people just gather like we're gathering now and talking about all the things we don't understand, it's because there's a gift in the not understanding and there's a gift in recognizing that these things are right now beyond our full grasp to explain because it allows us to react emotionally with fear and wonder and excitement and um and and it allows us to find a connection with each other because we're interested in the same things but but the fact that these things aren't conclusively answered opens the door for emotional storytelling and people do connect these things with their lives and they and it finds its way into the fabric of your life there are people who make ghost investigation clubs and they travel around their area or they go far flung and they investigate places. They go places they never would have been, meet people they never would have met, see things in the world they never would have seen because they're on the trail of ghosts. I mean, it's it's supernatural Anthony Bourdain. So whatever the thing is you love that gets you out of the house and gets you meeting people and gives you a common place to start a conversation, that's amazing. And and that's that's what this is. And so I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel like, oh, well, I'm not respecting the truth of, you know, the the, the every word he wrote. I told him, I'm like, I'm gonna I, I wanna tell the truth of what some of your theories are, but I can't do it if I just transcribe your book because it'll no one will see it. It'll be too clouded with fun details. I want to take all the fun details out and 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 allow my themes to sort of, because it's a movie, it's only going to be two hours tops. So, and he's like, I totally get it. And I sent him the script. I'm like, look, take a look at the script. And he had every right and reason to say, this is not my story. Take my name off it, do something else, you know, and just call it fiction. But he didn't, he got it. He's like, no, that's, that is my story. My story was about me trying to figure something out and never quite doing it. And that's what your story is. So same story. So go with God. Well, and I think also it's 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 an admirable thing to make a movie where you know how it's going to end and the en- ending is going to unsatisfy the audience, right? Like in a lot of ways it's like z- the z- the movie Zodiac by David Fincher, like there's no good way to end the movie. Just like Mothman, there's like there's n- I mean you end the events of the movie, but the Mothman persists. The Mothman will be back and die another day. I mean I, I mean you right cuz like <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's but that's more what I'm getting at. It's like the Mothman doesn't go away. Right. And neither does right. what happens well, that day. But like, again, like that's the th- I, I like that about your movie. My theory is always that the final minute of the movie is is the way to figure out the movie. So you just take the thing that happens at the very end and go, well, if it ended there, then just walk backward through the movie and you'll it's like doing a maze backwards. You'll you'll find the path and go, oh, okay, I get it, right? Because yeah. it ended there. If it had ended over there, then the story is slightly different. It's off a couple degrees. Right. And I figured if I end the story with John and Connie together, and it's like, yeah, well, we found, you know, we we you know, we pulled 36 bodies out of the lake and uh, or out of the river, and you know, Connie, you would have been number 37. And she's like, wake up, number 37. And they look at each other. With the feeling of that's what this was about for us as human beings who have to make sense of our lives and come up with our own meaning. That's what it means for us. And this is the story we'll tell our grandchildren. Well, like you mentioned earlier, like all the trying to figure out the Mothman and the plan and saving people like that's driving the the people that are involved is driving them crazy. But like early in the movie, Connie talks about her dream surrounded by presence in the water basically we're told the end of the movie at that point but we don't know it and so no matter like everything that happened like like you mentioned there's these choices that could have been made that would change the one degree and completely change the ending but i don't think like i said before like it it was this unstoppable force that maybe moth the mothman was just trying to communicate this is going to happen he could have answered the phone, but he never was going to, you know, to talk to his dead wife because Connie already talked about what was going to happen. <laughs> she already said well, she was going to be number 37. Well, you know, and we're given information earlier in the film that the voice that calls itself injured cold can also imitate other people yeah. because people say, oh, you called me the other night or, right. or, you know, someone else is like, oh, that's right. Know, what do you, you know, um, 
you know, uh, uh, Will Patton's on the phone and he says that Indra Cold is with him. He's standing right next whatever, to me. Yeah, whatever that energy is, is imitating his voice. So it's like, well, how, maybe it's going to imitate your dead wife. It's going to come on and imitate Deborah Messing, you know? Mm-hmm. And Connie is the only, that's what's so great about Connie. She's, the, she's always very clear eyed about this. She's like, you know, you don't have to do this. And that voice on the phone, what answer is it going to give you? You know? And that's the, that's the other, because we know, like, I know of people who go to um, psychic mediums all the time, to, uh, hoping to continually, continually, continually communicate and talk to a dead relative. And I get that impulse. And yet at the same time, it seems sad. And ultimately, why? You know, what is it going to go? What, what is one more supposed conversation going to give you beyond I'm in a different place now? I'm cool. It's all good. And I'll see you. I'll see you on August 13th this year, you know, whatever. But it's like, okay, got it. I don't need, I'm going to talk to a dead person every single day. Am I really talking to that? How much am I talking to that dead person? How much is he going to be talking to his wife? What answer is he going to get? Go on. Gotta go on. Yeah. Well, and I like the line Connie had, you can miss your wife here, (laughs) you know? And it's like, yeah. And you know, you're talking about this is the story of grief. It's like, it kind of lifts the veil of that. It's like, yeah, take a breath, exhale. And well, yeah. And that was, that was the real, uh, the real gift over time was people writing to me or, you know, communicating to me that the movie spoke to them on a level of a, um, sort of a a reflection on grief. Mm -hmm. My mother died. My sister died. I was going through a bad time. I watched this movie and it, it, it touched on those things and helped me, which is amazing because I wrote the movie and it was about grief, but I was not in a process of grieving. I was not coming from a place of, you know, someone close to me died and then I wrote them off Mad Prophecies. Grief is a part of everyone's life. Yeah, it's universal. It's universal and it has nothing to do with people you know dying. It has to do with things going on in your own psyche. Right. Parts of yourself dying, uh, your vision of the world dying, your vision of your parents dying, your vision of your childhood dying as you grow. Uh, it's almost like a snake uh, letting its skin go. You you go through these processes and grief was the theme. And people reached out and said, yeah, you nailed it. And that movie meant something to me. And I and I understand every and I've I've talked to people who come out of nowhere and tell me the theme of the movie. They're just like. You know, I love your movie because A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm like, well, you win the prize. You, <laughs> if it worked for you, then my my work is done. Well, and that's the thing for me that's what's really funny, Richard, is, you know, we've talked about plenty of times on the Culture Cast and other shows, the idea of X as Y in horror movies. And I think in a lot of ways, the Mothman is grief in your movie. I mean, you just said it, right? I mean, that that is what it is. But I yeah. love I, I love the idea also of, again, like that, in my opinion, is why this movie kind of came out too early. Because if it had come out in the last like three or four years, like people would be like, holy shit. Like, and I mean, again, like it has a cult following or whatever it's being claimed on IMDb or Wikipedia. But the thing is, like the message of the movie stays the same. The message of the movie is universal. And when I, I kind of put Dustin on the spot last night, when we were talking about the movie. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad we've both gotten there, which is exactly what you said, Richard, which is the grief and, you know, grief doesn't mean losing someone it doesn't have to mean that it can yeah. it universally in a lot of ways for a lot of people that is that feeling when those things happen. But I mean, grief is just, a, it's just another human emotion. I mean, I have, I mean, as someone who is going through things right now, including this show going off the air, I have a level of grief about that, about something yeah. that I have loved that is a creative endeavor, having to take a step back from it. And if if you, the listener, can understand that or that seems silly that I feel that way about a podcast, remember that anything that you've listened to has been an hour and a half of the amount of time spent doing all these things. So when you're in it, making it, you're in it. And like with Mothman, you were in it, making it like you, you had to throw yourself into it to get out of it what you wanted, which is a movie that talks about, Hey, you need to like look around for a second and realize that like, this is not okay. And you're making it not okay. (laughs) It's the thing. Grief makes it harder to make things easier for yourself because you ultimately make things harder for yourself unintentionally. And, you know, and people who are going through grief, you know, it works differently for everybody. 
you know, recently, uh, th- there's been a lot of sort of um, pushback on the five stages of grief um, because people are like, you know, the five stages. Yeah, those are common feelings that people have during a grieving process. They're not always felt in that order. They're not all felt. Sometimes it's just one or two or none or whatever. But but ultimately, people grieve differently, and it and it and it follows its own path. And and there are people who while they're experiencing grief, also experience self-judgment and exterior judgment about how they're experiencing grief. And there's some people who are like, I feel guilty because my mom died and it, it was three months ago, but I feel okay. And so now I feel like that makes me bad. Did I not love my mom? Am I a bad person? Do I not have feelings? Am I a sociopath? <laughs> and then you know, people are like, no, it's okay. If you, It is okay to feel okay. And guess what? A year from now, something might happen. You'll hear a song or find a letter and you, you'll you cry. And that's okay, too. <laughs> that's all part of grief. And then there are other people who are like, well, everyone else has moved on, but I haven't. So does that make me a broken person? Is there something wrong with me? Am I going to feel this way forever? And then you're questioning and questioning. And, and, and so the message now, and I think it's a healthy message, is grief is real. It happens. It is experienced differently by all kinds of people. And don't judge yourselves. And if, and, and then in a lot of cases, if your grieving process involves going to a medium and seeing if you can talk to the dead, have at it. If that helps you, great. There, that could be very therapeutic. And for a lot of people, it is. A lot of people are mired in grief and they have one session with a medium and they hear what they need to hear. They hear enough, whatever it is they hear, whether it's facts or whether it's just, you know, hey, they're in a better place now. And the people walk away and are like, I actually, yeah, I feel better. I can, I can get through my days a lot easier now. Well, and that's, that is the other thing about, you know, the Mothman prophecies and the idea, like you mentioned, of grief. Like, I, I think it, 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 for me, is more important to move through the grief, not be stuck in the grief, because being stuck in the grief, I think, at least for me, implies no movement being made at all. And like, and stuck doesn't necessarily imply complacency. I'm saying, or complacency or being complicit in one's own, you know, inability to move like some people just take grief way harder than other people and i mean again like having to learn coping mechanisms how to deal with those kinds of things in a healthier way is important and i mean again i think your movie at its core strikes to the idea of what does it look like for someone to have that grief and the way to handle it forced upon them effectively right well, it, I mean, he clearly, makes choices, obviously, like I'm not taking yeah. away the autonomy of the Richard Gere character in the movie. But at the same time, I'm in a gr- I'm I personally am grieving right now for things that have happened in my personal life. I don't expect the Mothman to show up and help fix it. And I also I mean, the other thing is, like, I don't expect that to happen because I know it's not going to. But similarly to Richard Gere in this movie, he knows he has to do better. And he does by not picking up the phone. And that is his right. decision to make that he does make outside of everything else happening. That decision that he makes allows him to save Laura Linney. Right. And it's a, and it's excruciatingly difficult for him to make that decision. Right. But it's the able, hardest he's, decision he's ever made, probably. Right. He, but he's only able to make it because he is rational enough to go. No, wait a second. I saw what happened to Will Patton. I don't want that. You know, that guy went over the edge and I am I'm coming right up to it. And that guy went so far, he ate a gun, you know, and I can call myself more sophisticated than him, but I, I, I'm, I'm on the brink. I'm pretty much tanking my career now and my credibility. And, and now I'm sitting in a room waiting for a ghost to call on the, f- like, what, what am I really doing here? He thinks he's going to alleviate his grief by solving this metaphysical question, because when you're grieving, it is kind of your, your brain is trying to grapple with the big unknown death. And he thinks if I can answer this, I'm going to figure this out. It'll, it'll give me closure and then I can move on from my wife, but it's the exact opposite. And that's what he, you know, that's what he figures out. So yeah, you know, you were saying a little earlier, I just wanted to say how fortunate I feel um, for so many aspects of this movie, but also because you were saying, well, if the, you know, the movie was, it was made today rather than then. And it's like, yeah, you know, maybe it would be accepted differently. But I, I will say the great thing about writing a movie that comes out in 2002 is that there's a home video market right. in 2002 that didn't exist in 1982. And, and then there's a cable market and there's, you know, there's DVDs. And, and then just as that was sort of, you know, coming, you know, getting to a saturation point and then falling off, here come the podcasts. 
where suddenly it's almost like just fan groups getting together. And it's like, let's talk about the things we care about. And then suddenly I, I hadn't, I talked about the Mothman prophecies three times in probably 15 years. And then starting at around 2017, I've talked about it 5,000 times <laughs> and I've loved it every single time. But I've been able to talk about it because suddenly there's there's this show, there's Astonishing Legends, there's, you know, Rob Christofferson's Our Strange Skies, there's... And and millions of others where people want to talk about this stuff and they want to talk about the movie and they want to talk about the the phenomenon and then they want to talk about other things too that are that are laterally connected. And now we can and we can and, and people can find the stuff that's interesting. And thank God the movie was again, I'll go ahead and say personally, I think it's well written, but it's beautifully directed, wonderfully acted. People still get something from it. And we live in a world now where I feel so lucky that I can hear about it because people don't reach out to me and say, Hey, I saw your movie. It sucks. Thank God. It wasn't successful enough for people to feel the need to take me down a notch. I never got up a notch. So all I hear are the people who are like, Oh, I saw you. Well, I liked it, <laughs> you know, and that's great. And they, so I get all the good stuff on Twitter and social media. And, and so I feel like, wow, you know, I did, I got what I wanted. I wanted to strike a chord with people and I did it. And I did it during a time in our human history when the normal fan can reach out any way they want and say, I saw your movie. Awesome. Good job. So did that kind of come out of nowhere? You said in around 2017 ish, uh, there's like this Mothman resurgence. Did it all of a sudden, like your inbox, your DMs, like, it's like, whoa, what's going it, on? It was it, at the time the movie came out in the earliest days of the internet, I got some, uh, I got some attention You're just from fans reaching out to my email account. You know, they, they found it somehow and they wrote me an email. <laughs> then they're a big blank spot. But yeah, my, my first time on Astonishing Legends was talking about the Mothman prophecies. And then, and then that sort of started the ball rolling again for other podcasters and then just other people in general. And so then, then you go to fan meetups and Monster Fest, you know, and various things and, and people know it and they walk up and they're like, oh, I really, you know, and then other thing, obviously this, like, oh, you wrote for Grimm, you know, or whatever, you know, I love that show, Witches of East End. And that's great too, because I think about that all the time. You'll hear so many writers of my generation. I'm 57 now. Okay. Guys my age, maybe a little older, they talk about Cole Shack, the Night Stalker, a podcast that brought Chris and Mike White and I together. And, um, the people who wrote on that show thought they were doing garbage work. They're just like, we're, we're working on a show that critics hate, the, the, the ratings are terrible, the end, you know? And there was no Twitter, there, there, was, there, were no, there was no Comic-Con, there was, there was nothing to, to prop these people up. Decades later, they've influenced everyone. Everyone who's doing the cool shit that we're loving started because they were a little kid watching Cole Shack. If only all of those, be, and it's funny because I'm, I'm sure, you know, David Chase knows, but David Chase has moved on. He's got the Sopranos, so he doesn't need that. But there are a lot of people who were involved in that show who I think probably went to their graves thinking, yeah, whatever, Cole Shack, fine. And there was no way for them to know that they were influencing a generation of people who were coming up and, and they were going to make their mark. And so it's nice. It's nice now that you can do work and hear back from people and, and like, it's overwhelmingly kind. And people just saying, hey, I love that show you worked on. I loved it. And and again, to bring it full circle, the correct response is, thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed that. Well, it's cool that streaming services and just the internet in general almost have allowed you, like creative works like this to always be on exhibit, like always be attainable. Well, that's what you hope. I mean, that's why it's so <laughs> scary now that these platforms are just like, yeah, we're scrubbing everything. We got like 12 shows now. You're like, what? I'm, I, I, I'm paying $14.99 a month and all I get to see is like, I don't know. I'm with My you there. theory is there should be, and they'll never do this because the um because they would have to pay residuals. But I think you, I think there's a way to do it. I think there's a way where, you know, I should be able to have Paramount Platinum, Warner Brothers Platinum. And if I pay a monthly fee of 22 bucks a month, I get access to everything Warner Brothers has ever made, every TV show, every everything. And they only and, and fine, only pay residuals on my viewership, okay? Don't it doesn't have to be, oh, well you ordered it up and therefore we have to open up a residual algorithm 
where suddenly we're paying all these people and we're we're losing all this money. Just let it be a view, a mm-hmm. single view. Okay. But there are people who would do that. There were people oh, who would yeah. like, yeah, I want to go watch. Uh, I'd like to see every episode of Riptide. <laughs> it's like, it would have to be on Universal Platinum. Nine to five, the TV show. Nine to five, the TV show. Just have the stuff out there for the people who want to pay. I was like, pay per view. Just have it. <laughs> and people will want to monetize the stuff you have. They just, they have not figured it out. It's like people who had Aladdin's lamp and started throwing it around and it fell over the side of the ship. And now they're all like, wait, well, how come we're not making money anymore? <laughs> Don't ask us. You figured out. You're the Wall Street geniuses. We'll see if they do. So, uh, Richard, I'll give you the uh, final uh, final thoughts on on the Mothman prophecies, a thing that, uh, like I said, is very near and dear to my heart, which is why I wanted to have you here to talk. About. Well, it feels like it has covered the span of my life, and yet it hasn't. Um, I found the book when I was, God, I don't know, 31, um, but it answered something. When I read that book, I was like, oh, so the, the, oh things are falling into place here, specifically for the kind of story I wanted to tell in that moment. But it was also the culmination of so many things. And and anything I did not address in writing The Mothman Prophecies, I got to address with the TV show Miracles, where we made 13 episodes that thematically were very much like The Mothman Prophecies. It was very much, it wasn't like, ooh, is it happening or is it not? It was all about, yes, it's happening. What does it mean to the people it's happening to? And once I got to do those two things as an artist, I was deeply satisfied. These things were not big hits. Mothman was not a hit. It never has been a hit. Miracles is an unknown show that is also unattainable. Like you can maybe get a DVD on Amazon every once in a while or on eBay. It's on no streaming systems, but it is 13 episodes of everything I ever wanted it to be. And the very fact that it exists allows me to feel like I got heard. I said my piece. It's out there. Someone out there will watch these things. They will connect with those themes and I will have done what I intended to do. So I feel very lucky. And mostly I feel lucky that I have never seen a Mothman in real life. And I don't want to. Very fair. Uh, very fair. Yeah. The uh, But according to the Point Pleasant Mothman statue, he has a rockin' set of cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love how Mothman has sort of become this weird like symbol for um, every kind of, you know, uh, every kind of sexual orientation or 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 or, or gender. A, Mothman exists as this as this sort of hero to all who who are undefinable and proud. Yeah. And have rock and booties at the same time. Yeah, rock and booties. Well, <laughs> you know. Some of it, some of it is autobiographical. <laughs> oh my god! Um, so Richard, until uh, well, until the next time we do something, more than likely not on this show. Uh, where can people find the things that you're working on? They can find it on Weirding Way Media. That's where I do stuff with you and Mike. And you can also find me on Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf on any podcast server you've got. Check it out. Rate, review, subscribe, enjoy. And as for Dustin and I, um, yeah, like I said, there will probably be one more episode coming on the pipeline for Scary Stories We Tell. But uh, as for us, big thanks as always to Dustin and Maggie for the album artwork and to our good friend Alex for the intro music. And uh, to you, Richard, for joining us and finally getting to do this. Finally, it's been... I know, right, man? Finally, we did it. I know, it's finally. um, And I'm glad that Dustin was able to join us because Dustin was like, is there something you want to do on your show? And it's like, oh, this. thank you for reminding me because show could have just disappeared and never would have gotten to do it. So um, since this is the penultimate time of saying this, we'll let our good friend, the host of Sightings, Mr. Tim White, lead us out. No mystery is closed to an open mind.